It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, author and analyst, and Mr. Henry Hazlitt, editor of the Freeman and business columnist for Newsweek magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable George Smathers, United States Senator from Florida. Senator Smathers, our viewers these days are spending a good deal of time trying to appraise the Eisenhower administration. You, of course, are the distinguished young senator who defeated Senator Claude Pepper from Florida in <coughs> 1950. And uh, your state, Florida, went most heavily for Eisenhower, I believe, of all the southern states. Now, sir, after four months, uh, what do you and you, most of your constituents think about uh, President Eisenhower and his administration? I think generally that most of them are still very loyal to and very appreciative of General Eisenhower, now President Eisenhower. I believe that they recognize he's had uh, considerable difficulty in moving into uh, the toughest job in the world, but I know that his personal popularity is very high. Does your mail specifically reflect any, any criticism of the administration? Well, my mail uh, shows some criticism of some of his appointees to the cabinet. For example, uh, I have received considerable mail which has been critical of the new Secretary of Agriculture, Mr. Benson. Uh, in addition to that, there has been some mail which has been critical of Mr. Wilson, even though the people who wrote those letters in each letter had stated that they had supported uh, General Eisenhower in his candidacy for the president. You say this is a fairly heavy mail against uh, Secretary Benson? <coughs> no, I, no, I wouldn't say it was a very heavy mail. As a matter of fact, there haven't been more than 15 or 20 letters, but of the criticisms which I have heard and that which I have received, it's been directed primarily at those two gentlemen. Well, I'm interested in the, in the criticism of Secretary Wilson, particularly since you're a man with a distinguished military record yourself. Uh, what uh, seems to be Mr. Wilson's trouble? What's he criticized for? Well, I... I actually don't know. It seems to be his, that, that they're criticizing his general attitude. I think that everybody recognizes that he's a very smart man. Uh, he's proven that to be the case. However, uh, in his appearances from the first time before the Senate committees where he refused to sell his General Motors stock and took the attitude that, as a matter of fact, they shouldn't even ask him about things like that, I think that some people began to get a little disillusioned about him. And I must say that in his subsequent appearances before the various, with the Armed Services Committee of the United States Senate, uh, his attitude has been somewhat, uh, well, let's say it hasn't been too cooperative with the result that it has aroused antagonism uh, in the Senate of the United he States and also it, among some people. It's more of that than they're doubting his military judgment. I don't More think that that's right. About his attitude. At, at the moment, I don't observe that there's any great criticism of the recommendations he's thus far made. And of course, when we start talking about this five and a half billion dollar cut of the Air Force, uh, there has been some criticism of that. But that has not been as much as just his general attitude. What's your own feeling on that, Senator, about this Air Force cut? Well, uh, actually, I think that. While we want economy and we must economize everywhere we can, I believe that we should not economy, uh, economize where it might endanger our national security. And I am one of those who's most anxious to have Mr. Wilson and the various, his various representatives explain to us just how it is we're going to get more national security with less money. If that can be done, I'm all for it. Well, are you reconciled more or less with the $74 billion budget for the next fiscal year, to the size of that, the overall dimensions of it? I think that we're already beginning to cut down some on this budget for next year. Uh, the House has done a pretty good job of pruning, and the Senate is thus far doing better than it has done before in cutting uh, government expenses. I think we're going to get the budget down possibly less than anybody had thought, but 
According to the new secretary, we're still going to have a six and a half billion dollar deficit. Well, you believe, what do you think about the excess profits tax? You think of continuing it at this time? I think that it's going to have to be continued for another six months, even though we all recognize it's a very bad tax, a very inequitable tax. And nevertheless, it brings in $800 million, and it will in the next six months period, and that money is needed now. You don't see any definite place where that $800 million can be cut out of the spending budget? Not, not, no, not now. Senator Smathers, one of the reasons that you and some other senators uh, gave in 1952 for being uh, critical of the Truman administration was that you didn't like the conduct of foreign policy under Mr. Atchison. Now, uh, have you been satisfied with the conduct of foreign policy under Mr. Dulles? To be perfectly frank, I haven't seen a great deal of difference between the foreign policy of Mr. Atchison and that of Mr. Dulles. As a matter of fact, everything that Mr. Dulles has done has seemed to me sort of a logical continuation of the program which Mr. Atchison had. Well, do you think Mr. Atchison's was a logical program? Or uh, are you talking about uh, not getting away from something? I, I had always felt that Mr. Atchison's program was actually a little bit too soft uh, in our dealing with our allies overseas and particularly soft in dealing with the communists. I had always felt that the communists uh, have respect for only one thing, and that's firmness and strength. And yet every time that we always bumped into them, uh, with the exception of Korea, when Korea started, we had always attempted to appease them, and I thought that was a very bad mistake. Now it appears as though uh, Mr. Dulles is apparently not being a great deal stronger or a great deal more firm than was Mr. Atkins. What, what are you feeling about this UN proposal uh, for this truce in Korea? Do you I think it goes too I far in yielding to the uh, uh, communist I, I, demand? I certainly do. I, think it's, I don't think it's a good proposal. I think that it sort of makes a mockery of the very things that we've been fighting for. We do want a truce if we can get it, but we want an honorable truce. We don't want to become expedient at this time and to give in on the very principles which we said we were going to uphold when we started in Korea. Well, do you think there's anything in the Taft speech, any of the proposals that he made, which ought to be considered? Well, as I recollect, uh, what Mr. Taft said at Cincinnati was that he doubted whether or not the United Nations organization uh, was an organization which could stop aggression. And I think that he can well, rather well prove that point, that it has not been able to stop aggression. However, I'm not <coughs> one of those who would scuttle the United Nations, but I don't think there's any sense kidding ourselves or overselling ourselves on what the United Nations can do or will do. Coming back to domestic policy, sir, I assume that uh, you and the people in Florida were quite uh, happy over the administration's support in the Tidelands matter. Now, you've scored a victory there. Uh, what's your next objective uh, in the Tidelands matter? Well, we were very happy about the Tidelands uh, victory because not so much in our state because we thought that we were going to discover oil. We now don't have oil off our shores, but we felt that it was important because it was a recognition of states' rights. It was a recognition for the first time that the federal government should not own everything and tell everybody what to do. It, it was a reversal of sort of a 20-year trend of centralization. So to the, in that respect, it was important to us. But where we go from there, the next question is, now that we have had it established that Florida on its west coast owns out ten and a half miles, the question now is, uh, what are we going to do about that land uh, underneath the water, which goes out even further than ten and a half miles, or what we call the continental shelf? And you hope, you hope to get uh, to establish a claim to a portion of that, I assume. Well, not to the title of it. We believe that the federal government uh, owns that land, but we feel that that federal property should be treated like other federal property within state boundaries, that the state should have some right of participation in the royalties and the mineral leases on that land. You took a strong position on the Thailand's controversy even in the... Uh, last election, didn't you? You opposed uh, Stevenson on that. Or Very much so. against it. Right. Yeah. Senator Smathers, uh, our viewers have heard a good deal of discussion about the Hawaiian statehood issue, and now there's general feeling that Hawaiian and Alaskan statehood have been postponed at least for another year, <coughs> and you and some of the Southern senators are given credit for that postponement. Now, sir, will you tell our viewers just briefly uh, what your objections are to Hawaiian statehood? Well, Frankly, I think that 
it would be a departure of 150 years of historical precedent if we reached out 2,400 miles, took in a people who are almost totally dissimilar to the people of the United States and made them the, the, the new state in the Union. And once we start that, once we break the precedent, once we begin to reach over vast territories of water or land for that matter, uh, we take in Hawaii, we then take in Alaska in the Republican platform of 1952. Many people don't realize that there was a provision there calling for the immediate statehood of Puerto Rico. So we have Hawaii, Alaska, and Puerto Rico. And uh, if we take those three in, why, then we go undoubtedly to the Canal Zone, the Virgin Islands, and so it goes. And well, I don't think <coughs> that we should start on this program of empire building. As a final question, Senator, and to come back to this highly emotional issue of Korea, and as a man who served three years in the Marine Corps, uh, do you feel that we should be very careful about the possibility of an easy truce there? I definitely do. I, I think it would be a grave mistake to make a mockery of what amounts to a hundred and... 30, uh, well, well, we've had 130,000 casualties. Those boys have fought over there believing very seriously that they were fighting for a noble principle that, that uh, might alone did not make right. And I think that if we suddenly became expedient and said just because we're not able to defeat these people, we're now going to make an easy peace with them, we're now going to let them uh, have their aggression, I think it would be a mockery of the fight which we have thus far put up, and well, certainly it would be a, a, a mockery of the memory of the boys who have been killed. Well, thank you, sir, for being with us this evening. Thank you. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Henry Hazlitt. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable George Smather, United States Senator from Florida. The wedding march, the band of gold, the bouquet thrown through the air, the shower of rice, these are all traditions of a wedding. Now many happy couples treasure special souvenirs of that memorable day. Longines duet watches, a longine for the bride, a matching longine for the groom, perfect twins in everything but size. Now best of all, these magnificent duets, like all Longines watches, are created with the artistry, the skill and the perfection which made Longines, in fact, the world's most honored watch. Honored by 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals and highest awards for accuracy from the great government observatories, Longines is the watch of highest prestige among the finest watches of the world. And yet, unbelievably, you may buy and own or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as 71.50. Now, for a wedding, for an anniversary, for the graduate, for Father on Father's Day, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, the television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companions of the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This is the CBS Television Network.